Hello, and welcome to the Project Good podcast. I'm your host, Anne Marie Hilton. Project Good is a social impact podcast interviewing experts and advocates about the pressing problems that we face globally and hearing how they suggest we move forward in the future. The Project Good podcast is brought to you by Project Good Work. The goal of this podcast is to inspire people and organizations to develop a mindset that can move others to positive action regarding the complex social issues facing people on the planet. For all this, we're focusing on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Diversity and inclu- inclusion has become a hot topic in the workplace for several reasons. One of those reasons is changing demographics. The workforce is becoming increasingly diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, age, religion, and sexual orientation, and other dimensions of identity these days. As societies become more diverse, it's important for workplaces to reflect and embrace this diversity to create inclusive environments. The other reasons are legal and regulatory considerations. Governments around the world have implemented laws and regulations aimed at promoting diversity and preventing discrimination in the workplace. Organizations need to ensure compliance with these laws and avoid legal issues related to discrimination and bias. And lastly, social and moral imperatives. There's a growing recognition that diversity and inclusion are fundamental values that contribute to social progress and equality. Many individuals and organizations feel a moral obligation to promote diversity and create inclusive environments that respect and value all individuals. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Lola Adiemo, who is the author of Thriving in Intersexuality, an advocate for immigrants in the corporate workforce, an employee resource group expert, and a corporate speaker. She enjoys helping leaders connect the gaps to move from business strategy to business results without compromising their diverse employees and teams. Let's get into the interview. Lola is a passionate and resourceful leader who believes in and actively promotes inclusive leaderships with the power of harnessing individual motivation to increase employee engagement in the workplace. She's a TEDx speaker, podcast host, author, consultant, and workshop facilitator. She leverages her voice and written words to advocate for an inclusive blend, an inclusive lens across every level with corporations, as well as the empowerment of individual contributors, managers, leaders, to own their careers and pursue their purpose and passions in the corporate workforce. In addition to her role as the founder and CEO of e- EQI Mindset, a management consulting company focused on team and employee research group optimization, Lola is, Lola is the co-founder of Sapien Logic, a technology company in San Diego, and the nonprofit Immigrants in Corporate. Lola is a strategic networker, volunteer, and mentor, and mom, sadly serving on the board of director of Girls of San Diego. Hello, Lola. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi. I'm good. I was like, wow, I'm like, Lola is doing so much. <laughs> I'm doing whole, though. I, I feel like that's the story of everybody who I know who is passionate about some of these issues, right? You, you get into it and then you do so much. I know. I'm like, how, I'm like, how I didn't have time to be a mom of three. I'm like, I'm, I'm a mom of one and I'm exhausted. <laughs> well, they get older and then they take responsibility. <laughs> okay. That's the secret. That's the secret. Right? Uh, mine is still, I'm still little. So I guess I just have to hold out for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it takes uh, help. It takes a support system, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm so excited to talk to you today about, um, you know, this, uh, I would say, a uh, hot topic. Uh, I think the topic became not that it wasn't uh, important before, uh, but it really started to stand out, I think, uh, during the pandemic. Um, and I think that's because we had time to think. Um, right. And, uh, and of course, you know, um, uh, the pandemic itself affected uh, different groups of people in different ways. Um, according to statistics that uh, came up through uh, different news channels and also uh, research done through uh, P, uh, P Research, um, it found that people who are in uh, what would be considered in the U.S. Um, uh, minority groups, um, so 
uh, people who were not uh, a white um, experienced the most, um, I guess you would say, inequalities um, right. during the uh, pandemic in uh, right. various ways. And so because of that, it, um, you know, I guess you'd say brought a magnifying glass uh, mm -hmm. as we saw people, uh, you know, running into the streets uh, through uh, protest and right. um, unfortunately, in some cases, uh, violence. It, uh, let's just say a lot has unfolded in these last yeah. four years. Um, yeah. I get I get exhausted talking about it. <laughs> yeah. so, so I guess um, you know, and obviously the thing that was affected the most during the pandemic is how we work. Right, we couldn't go to our workplaces like we yeah. used to. We were either working from home or maybe you weren't working at all because your company closed down or your job said, oh, we no longer need you. So um, after such an um, eye-opening experience, what would you say um, that I guess we have, uh, what's the, the lesson, I guess, that we learned initially from the pandemic about why diversity and inclusion is important in the workplace? Well, I love the the way you use the word magnifying lens because I think these are issues that uh, you know DEI advocates have been talking about for forever. But you know, all of these was exposed, and nobody could pretend they were not happening um, on both sides, right? The the employees and the employers, right? We had been conditioned to to accept some things as the norm when it comes to the workplace. And then leaders could pretend some things were not happening. But I, I think that that the pandemic really exposed and forced everybody to acknowledge that there is a problem and you, you take action to do something or you don't. Either way, the problem doesn't go away. And, and so it really exposed some of those um, inequalities, inequities in, in the systems, in processes, and, and for people in the way they do their work. Yes. Um, yeah, you, you brought up the point that we, you know, we couldn't ignore. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't ignore the problem, I think, for the first time, because um, uh, I guess pun intended and not intended in a way, there was nowhere to go. There was no escape. <laughs> you had to you had yeah. to sit there and think or you had to watch it on TV or you had to deal with it, like, uh, you know, emotionally in some in some way. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if somebody would say that was kind of one of the, um, I, uh, I've been looking at the pandemic in, in terms of not just a crisis, but what the benefits, um, uh, yeah. you know, found from it. So I guess that's one of the benefits in a way. It opened our eyes to really look at the, uh, the work, how we have been working um, right. and, uh, and then how it's been affecting people not only in, uh, you know, what are considered minority groups, but even men yeah. and women, right? Right, um, right. Uh, we, we found that uh, during the pandemic, because, um, you know, in, in most societies, um, women are the, the, the main uh, caretakers, right? And right. so when uh, the schools closed down, mm -hmm. who was going to, who was going to watch, who was going to watch the kids? Who were right. And in some cases, who were going to teach the kids if your kid was in school, right? Um, yeah. So we, we, you know, it's almost like we, well, I guess we kind of turned back time when you were like a little house on the prairie and you had to teach your kid, you know, cook the dinner um, and, you know, do whatever else you had to do around your house. And so women, um, all of the games that they had, um, you know, made in the years previous started to go backwards in the workforce. And they had to, uh, in a lot of cases, leave the workforce. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And so, um, you know, uh, because of all of this, you know, uh, I would say that this um, brought in, um, I guess, uh, another thing of uh, talking about, like, what are some of the, the, the common barriers um, that are keeping um, a lot of the companies, I guess, from um, you know, I guess including uh, all these different groups of people, right? Because the, that's one barrier that we, we definitely saw is that you you couldn't you couldn't be like you know in a million places at once. Right. But what what are other barriers that you 
um, I guess that either you've encountered or you've found that are popular? Yes. Yeah. So I think the the barriers really relate primarily to the way the workplace is structured. The systems have not been put in place. The processes have not been set up to be inclusive. And, and so when organizations try to treat this as, you know, just check the box or just get some results so that we can show that we are getting some results, um, it becomes exhausting or it ends up with a negative impact overall. Uh, I think a huge barrier is when organizations don't perform like a comprehensive assessment to expose the gaps. It's not a quick fix, right? Um, you know, so whatever needs to happen needs to be funded. It needs to be resourced, right? But when you're treating this as a one-off, oh, you know, we want to show that we have diversity and inclusion. So you update, you spend some money doing a website update or you send, spend some money bringing in a well-known speaker so that you can capture the metrics, right? Those things are treating the symptoms. If you as an organization don't do the work to diagnose where some of those pain points, some of those gaps are for your organization, that's going to, you know, you, you, are, not, you are not solving for the problem. You are treating the symptoms. And, and so a barrier is, uh, first, not not um, not doing a comprehensive diagnosis, not uh, allocating budgets, not providing um, qualified resources, not providing adequate training for everyone involved. Not just the DEI team. You know, we're not just talking about hiring a head of DEI and then. Uh, proving that you are doing something around the AI. We're talking about investing time and effort in bringing everybody together so that every part of the organization, people know their role when it comes to the AI and they are equipped to take the appropriate action when needed. Yes, um, you bring up like a, a ton of important points that I think, well, I've seen personally and I'm sure tons of people have seen personally that happen in a lot of organizations. Um, the first one I'm going to tackle that you brought up is uh, the check, what I'm calling the uh, the check fox um, theory, right? Um, that you, you've taken care of it if you have someone who is uh, non-white on your team, um, you know, in some kind of position and, right. uh, you know, that's good enough. But... Even if you get somebody who is necessarily, you know, maybe they, they are, uh, you know, considered non, non-white, um, that you maybe have selected someone that, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess here's the, here's the thing that I see. Like you pick someone, obviously you want somebody that's going to fit in your company, right? But they may um, not have uh, uh, really a diverse perspective. Because you've maybe chosen someone that, um, you know, uh, kind of is just uh, um, similar to you, but you don't really, um, you have to pick somebody that's really like different to introduce a whole different thing um, than, uh, you know, maybe everybody else in the company is, is thinking. Um, so, for example, uh, somebody uh, told me about this example um, some years ago, and then I was like, aha, because I've seen that happen a lot. And let's say you have like um, an accounting firm, right? And mm -hmm. so in your accounting firm, you want to, you know, uh, check your, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion box. So you hire, you know, Eddie, who, you know, went to Harvard, um, but he, he happens to be, you know, uh, African American. So Ray, um, and, uh, you know, he grew up in, uh, you know, the most expensive the suburbs, um, and, uh, you know, gets along great with the team. And so you're like, okay, now we can assign Eddie to take care of all of our minority clients. Cause he understands minorities, right? <laughs> That's what I see happen time and time again. Right. Yeah. Yep. 
<laughs> and so, you know, nothing against Eddie, right? He's probably a great guy, right? Yeah. Um, he's probably smart, right? He went to Harvard. <laughs> yep. uh, but Eddie has um, a, a, a maybe an unusual experience for not only, um, you know, for maybe a good majority of people in the country, <laughs> right? <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and Eddie now is going to be talking to, you know, um, Samuel, who is from, you know, um, Compton, um, you know, and, uh, um, you know, uh, comes from uh, a home that uh, maybe didn't have very much money growing up. And now he's going to be like, yes, we, you know, uh, just because we are both um, African-Americans, we can bond. And that's what people think. But that's not really, I guess, what you'd say, a lot of people, a lot of companies miss that point. I'll yeah. let you kind of talk to that. I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah. So um, I I know it, it's it's always coming from that point of we want to do something, right? We we don't know what to do, but we want to do something. So um, we we will put the <laughs> we will put the person that looks like they they, they can help us. And and I know there's a mix to this because something that happened during the pandemic was also um, some attacks on people who were not part of a minority group that were being given roles and an assignment to uh, kind of lead DEI initiatives, right? Um, and there was sort of like the other side of that is you are not you are not you are not an expert on my story. I am an expert on my story and experience. Um, so I, I think there's a balancing that is needed, right? Because when, when you think of DEI um, initiatives, when you think of the person leading DEI, it can only be one-sided, right? When we are thinking of DEI, is not uh, as a whole in an organization setting, it's not just uh, racism, it's more than that right it's a whole lot of different things and different pockets and different initiatives and think different uh points to note so there's the education piece and and there's also the transparency around whatever choices you make and and whoever you put in in a role the why and and then their responsibilities as as leaders of initiatives like this so i guess so what 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 is what is your question for me around that? Is it like what I've seen or what? Yeah, what yes. Is? Like this is I, I'm sure this is like uh, I, I've seen this, and I'm 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 mm-hmm. pretty sure that you've seen that that um, that uh, you know the um, I guess the the way that the checks box is uh, uh, done mm-hmm. is like oh okay if somebody looks like somebody else that they right. should you know have the same experience. Um, oh, yeah. And I understand each other and they understand and understand each other and know and, and know for sure um uh, you know how that uh how that person um you know may relate um relates to the other person with no trouble at all. Um and I don't think that that is uh you know um what well, we know because uh you know people yeah. are individuals that that's not true. And then, that's the thing that I always find over and over. Like when you go through and you scroll on company websites and you look mm-hmm. for uh, the, you know, a diversity person, it's usually, you know, uh, either somebody African-American, usually it's somebody African-American. <laughs> and I'm just going to be honest. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and it's just like, well, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they should understand everything across the board, but that's just right. not, not, not true. Right. Um, and, and so, um, you know, that's, uh, that leads me to this question is, um, when companies are developing their, their product and uh, policy, what are some key mm-hmm. considerations, uh, should they have for developing, um, these diversity and inclusion policies? Right. So I think it starts from that understanding that inclusion and belonging is not a one side fits all. It's not a one size fits all, right? Um, part of why I talk about intersectionality a lot from the employee perspective is um, it's not the leader's job to make me feel belonging because you don't know me. You can't you can't please every single employee um, 
by the initiatives that you start. And, and why I advocate strongly for employer resource groups is you, you can know what everybody needs to feel belonging, but you can create a space where people feel safe and comfortable enough to, um, to express themselves, to share their views and thoughts, and to bring their authenticity to work. Right. So I, I, I think a lot of times leaders try to like, you know, the, the in thing is black. So we have to really um, do something. We have to make the black employees happy. We have to do this. And then you um, you create problems for people who are not black. Right. And then you start having people speak up around uh, negative experiences or you focus on women. You say our goal is to do these for women because that's what we are prioritizing at our organization right now. All right. Th those things might be true. They might be needed. But have you done the work to make sure that outside of what you are driving, you are providing a safe space, a psychological spa safe space so that people can let you know what they need to feel belonging. Right. Because it's not the same for everybody. Right. I might. You know, you might look at me and see a black woman and maybe what is most important for me, what I need right now for this season is tools and resources as a parent to help me feel belonging at work. Right. Um, and then you're shoving things down my throat that is not a priority for me right now. Right. Things are moving in seasons. People go through transitions. People are in different career phases. So going by physical and just driving initiatives to please one um, at an organization le organizational level, um, we have to be careful around that. You know, create the space for inclusion and belonging, not, not um, a point for people how they should feel belonging because you don't know, you know. We are all uh, a mix of, mix of identities, intersections, and... Um, a combination of various things and complex humans, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> so um, I, we need to create the space where people feel safe and comfortable to get to that belonging the way they choose to, not the company. Naturally, when you, you know, when you try to impose things on people, they push back, uh, and and that's very natural. It's that freedom of. Um, choice and safety and expression. How are you creating those spaces in your organizations, within your teams, within your meetings, within your departments, um, in the workplace? Yes. And so, you know, I think this is, you hit on, on the point, I think that is um, the most complex um, issue. And this is, you know, I, I've never been, a, you know, a, a diversity and inclusion um, you know, expert or director or having to, you know, be the person to develop these types of policies. But just like I think um, anything in the workplace, the the biggest challenge that I see in overcoming, um, uh, I'm just going to say change, is um, each individual's mind, right? And so, how I guess this is this is this is uh, you know a, a big question and a complicated one and I don't think there's like one answer so don't feel intimidated yeah. by it. Um, how do we begin to really get inside each employee's mind and start shifting their thinking of how they see their colleagues who are different from them? Um, from, uh, you know, either an ex eth ethnic standpoint or a, you yeah. know, um, sexual orientation standpoint or, you know, right. um, uh, so how do we, how do we really get into their mind? Right. Um, so you, you asked me a question that I will answer from an employee resource group perspective, because this is exactly part of why I focus on ERGs in the workplace. And when I use the term ERGs, it's, Employee resource group is a catch-all phrase um, for me, or if you have affinity groups, if you have business resource group, some people call it colleague resource group, creating communities in the workplace that allow that cross collaboration and interaction. Because if you think about it, workplaces are created based on roles 
and job job description, right? You hire people based on their job description. You're not looking at their history. You're not looking at their family history or their identity, right? You put a job description, you get a skill set, and then people get into their jobs and they are doing their jobs. And a lot of the interactions are really result focused, right? We're trying to get this project done. This is this person's role. Now, when you create that avenue for people to connect with others who don't necessarily, who might not have worked with them on a normal um, uh, work project or team, there's an exposure opportunity right there. And that's what the employee resource groups or your communities in the workplace are really about. There are inclusive spaces where uh, people now are getting a different interaction from whatever it is that you have as a background. Um, and so I'll, leveraging those spaces to get into employees' minds also includes uh, transparency, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability from leaders and, and members of those groups, right? Like, for example, you create a group um, around disability, you have conversations going on around that topic. You don't have to be somebody with a disability to attend an ERG event around disability, but you can get educated. You can get new knowledge and information that you didn't know. You can learn something new around your coworkers that you might otherwise have not known, right? So these pockets of inclusive communities in the workplace goes beyond the natural uh, structure of the workplace and allows for conversation that enlightens other people um, while also providing an opportunity for people to share, right? So it, it starts from creating those spaces and then hosting very um, vulnerable conversations, having people that people can relate with who show up and tell their stories and then um, a space for resources because it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not a quick fix. It's, it's a measure of how, how much trust really exists within your organization, right? That would determine how long this process takes. Do people feel safe around the initiatives or the groups you have created? Do people feel safe enough or welcome enough? Um, to participate, to listen in, to associate with these inclusive communities where they feel like I don't have anything in common. How do you present these spaces, these communities? Do you present it like, as a closed door space where only the members are invited, right? Or do you present it as a space where you can show your support and you can learn more? So again, it's very powerful when you can define what groups you want to create, what communities you want to build, and how you use those communities um, to get into the minds of the members and also the allies. Wow. You know, I, you, I because I think in pictures, I started, you know, picturing like uh, companies of how, um, you know, they have usually this is, uh, you know, run through uh, HR. But they, right. you know, host, uh, you know, different things like we're having, you know, this uh, brown bag lunch about, you know, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. Uh, the, one of the things, though, that uh, really is sinking into my mind right now is that work itself is changing. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is how we work. Right. So as I was talking about in the beginning, um, a lot of uh uh, work is now done remote or from home. And so you have these large companies and maybe all the employees are now working from home, um, such like uh, Twitter, I believe, um, and, and and big companies. And so you have like, you know, obviously a lot of employees from a lot of different places, maybe, you know, in, in even different countries. And so how do you, and this is another one of those trippy ones, uh, so then in these um, uh, remote companies, do you find, I'm going to ask you two questions about it. So do you find that now that uh, a lot of companies are doing this remote um, kind of work style, that it has made people feel more included in a way because they are now um, mixing their work and life together so they become more relatable because since we are humans, we have to all do the same thing? 
Right. I think, I think so. I think it's a mix for different people though, because I, I heard somebody make a comment that kind of stuck with me in 2021, 2020, those years that blended together. Um, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that one I long know. year that never ended. <laughs> I, I know, 2020 and 21 feels like one long year. Um, <laughs> but I heard somebody make a comment that we brought work into our home and not everybody is comfortable with that, right? Um, some people prefer to keep home and work separate. And so being first to bring work into your home, um, it's a different thing than choosing, you know, choosing to work from home remotely, um, which is kind of where we are getting into now. It's people trying to determine, do I want to work remotely? Do I want to work hybrid? Uh, in 2020, 21, 21, nobody was asked. We all had to. You know, we all had to work remotely. And so it didn't work for some people. It worked for some people. Now companies are making all these decisions, trying to accommodate everybody. So I, I think there were those that struggled with that. There are those that, you know, um, which is part of why we had the great reshuffle and whatever, because people now had to say, what is my decision? If I have a choice, what do I want to do? We didn't think that way before. Before it was, this is the way work is done. We all get to work. We all scramble in the morning. Um, the kids, for me, is the kids eat breakfast in the car because we're trying to get into the workplace. <laughs> you're racing in the evening after work to pick up your kid before daycare closes, right? That was just the way work is done. You know, if you choose to work, you do all of these. And then we went the other way, the other extreme in 2020, 2021. Everybody is forced to work from home. Um, yeah. So I, I think all of that as is helping people now realize that, okay, if I have a choice, what do I want? What do I prefer? And, and so that choice now is where we're going through because companies are trying to accommodate all of the choices and people are trying to make decisions based on what they want to do and, and what kind of environment they work to work in. So I think we've, been awoken <laughs> to the reality that we have choices when it comes to our jobs and our careers. And that's a huge part of what 2020, 2021 has done. Um, and that awareness definitely has created more, um, you know, restlessness and changes for people right now than, than before. Yes, um, definitely. Um, yeah. And so that, uh, restlessness that you're, that you mentioned, um, you know, I guess, uh, we've seen it play out not only, I guess, uh, in people's homes, but, uh, like almost every inch of society now. And so I think we are definitely in a period of like, uh, I guess rethinking life, I, I call it. Um, and so, um, in rethinking and in, in rethinking life, because, this is just my personal thoughts. And of course, you know, um, each person thinks differently, but I think when it comes to diversity, um, it's all about, I guess, uh, as you get older and you are in the workplace and, you know, maybe when you were growing up as a, a child, you, you know, I say live in your, you know, box of uh, mm -hmm. whatever your community is. But then once you, you know, grow up and if you decide to, you know, have a career and or get a job, um, that uh, then you are now thrown into um, this, uh, you know, what I call the the larger university universe, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, of yes. the world and the box that you grew up in uh, and that you were comfortable with uh, is fading away or becomes uh, I'll use the word questionable, right? So everything right. that you were taught in that box, it worked for that box because that's all you knew. But, right. but now, and especially now, and that's why I wanted to bring up this whole discussion about remote world, uh, uh, remote work. And because of remote work, right, you might have a team member, even though here you are as well, was sunny California, <laughs> set, set, yeah. uh, California, and your team member is now over in Australia or mm -hmm. Belgium or 
you know, wherever. And so everything that you thought um, about how things and people were are becoming not so. And so I think in the whole diversity and inclusion uh, like industry, it's all about, I guess, rethinking how you see life. Right. Um, you know, uh, at least that's, that's, uh, that's the perspective that I, I, I think, and that's um, what I've pulled from, you know, um, what I call the DEI movement. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And I, I mean, and there's, a, there's a natural order of things here as well, right? Um, it's the same thing. We all grew up in our own bubble um, as an immigrant. One of, you know, the, the things I talk about is I also grew up around norms and, you know, just that tiny bubble of a homogeneous community of people that look like me, similar um, life stages, right? And families with similarities. So we all grew up in our bubble, whether you're part of a minority group or a majority group. Um, but this is, this, is, this is whatever background we have, that's what we bring to the workplace. And there's a learning process, even to college, right? When you go to college, there's a phase where you try to like figure out what's going on and get comfortable with what's going on. And then you start to um, understand what are my goals here? What do I need to do? But college is so short that, you know, you can just focus on your grades and then you're out. You're and then you get into the workplace and this is not, this is not a one or two year program. We wish. I know. I was thinking I wish. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That would be nice. Yes. Um, you are getting into the workplace is like this way of life. And a lot of times we come in with our own, you know, biases and perspective and beliefs, but we come in trying to understand what's going on and observe what's going on and fit into what's going on. Right. And we don't, we are not empowered or equipped to kind of question things or to figure out what's the right way things need to be done. No, we just look at what is being done and we flow with it. So it's kind of one direction, which is what COVID shook up for us. It, it, it's like, okay, I know there's a season where I get to observe and see what's being done. Uh, but at some point, um, I want to be able to speak up. I want to be able to share. I want to be able to bring those perspectives that make me unique. I want to be able to bring my diverse perspective into these conversations so that people can learn. I also want to be able to learn, right? And, and we need to have that in the workplace because this is not a two-year program. Again, this is my life now as an employee or, or employer. Yes. And so, you know, this is my last question, which is uh, simple and yet not simple at the same time. Um, what would you, uh, for, I guess, organizations as, you know, they are uh, facing, I would say, a challenge right now of um, uh, getting uh, great talent, uh, retaining great talent, um, and, uh, you know, and then I would say keeping their employees happy, Um how can organizations attract and retain diverse talent um, in this time? So your, your question is, how can organizations take action this time? Yes, and, and retain uh, diverse talent. Because I think retention is, employee retention is, uh, you know, um, is a challenge these days, I think. Uh, definitely after the, the pandemic, yeah. as they would say, the the veil has been has been lifted that you have a choice. <laughs> we always did, but I guess people didn't know. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think retention is definitely a big uh, question now. So I will say be more intentional around the plan and the strategy. Um, be transparent where you are on the journey. I, I think traditionally we've had the closed door conversations around diversity numbers and uh, initiatives. But now people know that they, they, this is a journey, right? This is a long-term journey. This is a long-term process. So are you carrying your employees along? How are you being transparent about and honest about where we are now, where we are going, 
uh, what are the actions we are taking? What are the steps we are taking to get there? And and celebrating the milestones, right? People appreciate uh, transparency. They want to know that they are part of the conversation and they want to know that you as a company, you are working on this journey um, to be better. You know, you, they don't just want to see the good numbers and the PR messages that you put out. It, it's it's about what 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 is the reality of working here? Um, what is the what does the future look like for me? Right? Am I uh, going to continue to be proud to work here? Do I have opportunities here? Um, and then create creating career development plan is also another big one um, for the workplace now because. Roles are changing, jobs are changing, you know, new technologies, new development. So employees want to know that I have a path here, right? You are invested in me as a person and I can continue to grow my career here. Yeah, I love that answer. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the perfect answer because I think, you know, um, the biggest uh, question Overall, I think of the whole pandemic, um, it left people in a um, introspective um, state of figuring yeah. out who the heck am I? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, perfect, perfect answer. Um, thank you, Lola, for your time and insight. If you'd like to learn more about Lola, you can go to uh, www.lolaspeaker.com. If you have a passion for an underserved community, a social justice problem, or simply want to change minds, contact Project Good Work at projectgood.work to start your project of change today. We'd like to send our deepest gratitude to our ongoing show subscriber, Blair Chapman. Subscribe to our mailing list at projectgood.work slash subscribe to get our episodes and blog articles sent to you each month. And plus, you can get a 10% discount on any project you start on projectgood.work. For our listeners, thanks for tuning in to Project Good, where we're focused on what matters. 